Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night by Dylan Thomas Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning they, do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight, and learned too late they grieved it on its way, do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. All right, everybody, hail and welcome back to another episode of Midgard Musings. My name is Jesse, and I am the host here on this channel. If you are interested in subjects pertaining to Norse heathenry, Germanic paganism, and quite often what is usually referred to in modern day as Ossetru, then I invite you to please subscribe to my channel and make sure that you have enabled all notifications so that way you get alerted every time that I upload new content, go live on this channel, and generally just have any sort of activity going on here. We are growing by the day and would love to continue to grow, so please be sure to follow along, head down into the description area to find out all the other ways that you can support Midgard Musings. And as always, I wanna thank each and every one of my subscribers and especially my patrons on Patreon for continuing to support what I do here on this channel. So as you can see by today's video topic of discussion, we are going to be talking a bit about death. Um, it is a topic of discussion that brings up a lot of debate, a lot of individual ideas and concepts get inserted into uh, our religion into this 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 uh, spirituality so I wanted to talk a bit today about some things that we perhaps do know um, or have some evidence of knowing of how our ancient ancestors may have understood things like death and the afterlife and how it impacted their lives day to day um, so the most striking evidence of the Germanic heathen sense of an afterlife after death, you know, the reason we're talking about this now is so many uh, ideas or concepts that come up around, you know, what happens after one dies, you know, the, the, the parts of the soul. I've done videos here on this channel about <clears throat> the soul complex and other heathens out here um, on YouTube and abroad. Have spoken about this as well um, but it does it does tend to really spark a lot of conversation um, the mysteries of what happens after death um, but the most striking evidence as i said of you know ancient germanic heathen senses of the afterlife is <clears throat> probably also the least surprising since it does directly reflect the afterlife concept of you know pre hellenistic greeks Jews, Balts, Slavs, uh, and Celts to a larger degree. Life after death is essentially a continuation of life in the grave. 
Um, life within the grave could be tedious and boring, you know, tiring, cold, social, and lonely. A lot of the things that we face and experience now um, in the life above ground, <laughs> as it were, life outside of the grave. Um, <clears throat> but after death, um, or after life, I should say, you know, after one has died in the afterlife, uh, the comforts of home were to be provided by the family with the collection of grave goods left with the body or the ashes or remains of, uh, you know, if it was a cremation sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and through the periodic offerings left for the venerated dead in exchange, uh, the one skill that the dead were known to possess in abundance, which was protection. So basically, um, when the family members would, would die, um, it was up to the surviving family to make sure that their loved ones had the comforts of life that they had while they were alive to continue to offer and provide protection to those living family members in, even in death. So the dead could protect the home and familial lands from invasion by, you know, ill luck, ill health, uh, by men ill disposed towards the family. Having ones dead uh, in the ground offered the, the Odal lands uh, protection from above by the living and from below by the dead. So kind of all bases were, were, uh, were covered. There would be ceremonial offerings called, I believe the, the word would be mina feasts or mina ale, uh, and especially in regions, uh, at least in Sweden, <clears throat> these ceremonial offerings were offered to the dead at prescribed intervals after death, usually at 30 days, 60 days, and then either every 90 days or six months, depending on the regional variations, and then yearly after that. So veneration of the dead as an important and primary part of the heathen Germanic worldview and among other various cultures living in the northern template zone uh, contemporary to the north. So the, the veneration of our ancestors is, is such a very important thing um, that this is how we know of that our ancestors would have, would have done that. Um, <clears throat> the grave mound remained the standard concept of a heathen afterlife in spite of the apparent confusing array of destinations after death described by mostly modern authors as opposed to researchers. You know, there appears to be little or no evidence that the soul was ever conceptually viewed as being separable from the body, i.e. like dualistic, um, but it could be uh, sent on special errands from its home in the body and always able to return to its corpse after the task was accomplished. And this is what kind of goes into the parts of the soul, the parts of self. Um, you know, it's not just one part of you that is, that exists um, in the afterlife. So although this extending of the soul out into the world, you know, shows up most commonly in later Folklore, uh, there are indicators in a few sagas, at least, that some during the uh, heathen period accepted the idea of what is now called uh, astral projection. Um, so again, <clears throat> there were parts of the self that could be sent on errands or, or special assignments or tasks. Um, and it would be that they, you know, part that part of the self would uh, leave it, the, the corpse part, um, you know, the lich, as it were. Um, and be sent out to to do you know a variety of things uh, potentially um, there's some speculation that that concept may have been brought in through contact with shamanistic tribes uh, such as the Sami um, possibly the early Finnish and even some of the tribes along the the Volga so we we definitely uh, see that that influence was um, very specific to the influences or you know or the, or the, the, the concepts were, were specific to um, the influences um, of the people and the tribes around in that area. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, places after death, right? We, 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 as heathens, we've talked about hell, we've talked about Valhalla, we've talked about you know these these places of, of an afterlife, right? The resident hall of the gods, sort of thing, comes up periodically in different conversations. But hell, uh, H E L, uh, appears to have been a communal extension of the grave grave mound concept. Um, and Valhalla, uh, which a poetic variation, which probably in reality has had very few believers, if any, um, from, from, from ancient times. So archaeological studies of graves near battlefields show that the buried dead were outfitted in exactly the same manner um, as burials near community sites. So were there an actual difference in afterlife concepts between, you know, village dwellers and warrior bands or warrior, you know, war band cults, that sort of thing? Had there been an actual difference between the afterlife concepts, then one would expect differences in burial customs. The important point um, consistently reinforced in uh, later, um, in, in later Norse literature and medieval folklore is that it was important to get the dead comfortably into the grave and hopefully keep them there. <laughs> um, those who died away from home uh, presented a special problem because uh, the family was deprived of one of its own which would serve to protect the family lands and because the family could not be sure that the dead were, were properly in in interred. Um, there's this sort of Norse limbo as it were for the drowned at sea uh, that envisions this sort of uh, <clears throat> nets of Ron uh, concept. And conceptually, uh, Valhalla may have served similarly to allay some of those fears as well. So we see the customs being very similar, but like um, they, they, they came up with these ideas of, well, because they're not, because we can't take them back to our family lands and bury them there and keep them there and have them protect uh, us and, and be that sort of protection for us um, then they are in Valhalla now because they died on the battlefield or they are they are with Ron because they died at sea that sort of thing <clears throat> um, and another thing is that uh, reincarnation so although uh, reincarnation is often discussed in modern times as being closely bound to early heathen beliefs um, any evidence of metapsychosis available comes directly from early Christian influences. There's absolutely no archaeological evidence of such a belief. Now, the idea of quote-unquote passing on certain qualities from like one generation to the next, however, did exist and was in fact quite common. Um, so I think, you know, it's maybe unfortunate that modern translations of that or modern translators of that concept insist on using the terms you know, <clears throat> reincarnation or born again when it comes to to those sort of things. It would be, I think, maybe more apropos to use things like posthumously inherited or past X on, so to speak, rather than saying, you know, <clears throat> reincarnated. Uh, but similar beliefs are seen in neighboring regions as well. The grave mound or minor variations of the concept seems to have been the only verifiable afterlife destination uh, period. So <clears throat> a problem for most people nowadays in modern times with acceptance of the ancient Germanic heathens uh, attitudes towards dying and, and death is that you know the ancient heathens didn't it, that, that, that concept, those concepts, they don't necessarily match very well with what is customary in the modern era, right? How, how difficult or how much bureaucratic red tape um, does one have to go through to be able to let's just say for instance bury a family member on your property it's again it, it doesn't really mm, fit too well in, in modern days um, so there's that <clears throat> um, because it's not customary or it's you know there's a lot to go through and that the you know factual ancient concepts don't match well with the modern perception of what the ancient heathen may have believed you know so there's there's it's kind of a twofold 
problem at minimum. On the one hand, there is a pervasive desire for eternal life. You know, the uh, eternity is not now only defined by the dominant religion in Christianity. It's also um, by the scientific fields of mathematics and physics. It's taught in schools, popular science, pseudoscientific magazines. We see it in TV shows, New Age philosophy, and now even in, you know, alternative uh, religious philosophy, uh, which paganism and heathenry and, and all that kind of fit into. So there's that. Um, and then the other problem, you know, on the other hand, is that we have this, quote, gold, golden age myth. You know, the idea that at some point in the memorable past, things were so wonderful and beautiful and, uh, the, 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 you know, technology and science lived in perfectly balanced harmony with spirituality and philosophy. You know, the facts are, as we can best know, um, it reveals that the golden age myth is... It, it's it's just exactly that it's it's a myth um so <clears throat> here are some things that we do know about an older heathen worldview or an arch heathen worldview regarding afterlife concepts N number one is that graveyards were not separated from the communities as they were after uh you know the conversion period where you had you know <clears throat> people being buried in in a large cemetery sort of thing, uh, very, very indicative of, of Christian behavior. Um, prior to the conversion period, you know, family members were buried on family lands. Uh, number two is that graves themselves were outfitted for life continuing underground or in the grave after the point of death, you know, making sure that that family member uh, went into the mound with their possessions, with things that would ensure that their life thereafter would be a comfortable one. Uh, we see there to be no indication of an afterlife destination, right? Such as hell or the halls of fill in the blank, you know, with the name of a god or goddesses sort of thing, you know, the gods, uh, the gods halls that we hear about in some of the lore. Uh, we don't hear anything about that, like uh, Valhalla, or, uh, anything like that. None of those afterlife destinations that are popular in, in modern day, uh, we don't have any indication that that was a thing. We don't see it um, on any kind of memorial stones or markers until uh, up or until rather the region became, uh, you know, influenced um, by the church, by, by Christianity. So we don't see any of these memorial stones that talk about Valhalla or any of that uh, in the region uh, until again that kind of like that local version of the age of, of syncretism which is basically once the church missionaries and, and Christianity showed up now all of a sudden it's oh the dead go to this place if they died that way and they go to that place if they died this way and Snorri Sturluson I'm talking to you buddy <laughs> um one other thing is there are at least in uh, uh, there 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 is though at least a, a consistency from the let's say Neolithic up through the Iron Age, um, and it is during the Viking Age when changes began to appear, i.e. the conversion period. The time associated with the changes co coincides with the entry of Christianity uh, into the North. So once again, that's why we see or that's where we see those things start to appear when and where we see those things start to appear um specifically valhalla as an afterlife destination begins to appear first in the uh, southern germanic regions and its successive development follows closely on the heels of the development of syncretism you know falling in between the native germanic periods and the point of conversion to christianity it's not the same as saying that valhalla's development uh, was modeled after the Christian afterlife or Christian heaven, however. Um, but that's also worth noting um, how that how that concept kind of got popularized, especially in modern time. You know, and then lastly, um, there is a measurable difference between that which is presented in Sagaic literature and skaldic poetry. 
and then that which is presented in Edaic poetry, where you know eternal fame and living in the grave mound plays primary roles in the former, uh, and that the destinations after death and concepts of dualism are in the foreground of the latter. So there's some things to think about. Now, what is it? What does that mean for you and I? What does what is all this? I mean, what's the takeaway from all this? Um, you know, and for me, the takeaway is I don't, I guess, you know, over time I've in, in my heathenry, I have come up with and developed my own worldview on things, but it, it does pull strongly from the historical side of things, how you feel, what you, what you feel, what you've experienced, what you know, um, visions you may have had, things you may have experienced, etc., etc. all this, you know, kind of UPG type stuff. Um, nobody can discount that. Nobody should be discrediting it and, and saying it is invalid. The challenge or the, or the biggest thing I think that we have with UPG type stuff like that is that some people out here want to pass it off as fact, right? Well, because I felt it and because I saw it, then this is the way it had to, must have been, you know? Um, again, these, the, the things that I just talked about, these are archeological studies. These are, these are things that have been d discovered through research. Um, not trying to play on a modern hype or a modern, you know, tr uh, feeling of, of the way it might've been. It's, you know, this is what we have seen. This is what people have found. And, uh, that's where it's at. So for me. Um, my thoughts and my beliefs on the afterlife uh, and what happens, you know, where the journey takes us after our life that we know it, um, who really does know, who knows ultimately. Um, what I do know and what I have felt, okay, so a little bit of a UPG warning here myself uh, for everybody listening and watching is that, you know, we, the, the, those departed loved ones, they are still with us. There are parts of them that, that still remain. Um, and how much they are a part of our lives does largely depend on whether we want them to be a part of our lives or not, you know? We sing songs to their memory. We talk about them. We mention their names. We share photos. We share memories. We share you know, stories, we, we speak of, of them and, and we keep them alive in that sort of way. Um, and I feel like that's an important part of getting comfortable with our perceptions of, of death. You know, it's not the end. It's just a continuation. The journey continues for us and for them after our bodies uh, expire and after our bodies die death is not the end and you can say it all day long you can think about it you can come up with your own ideas of what happens you can study you can research you can find answers of how our ancestors may have perceived that sort of thing but it's definitely not the end. That is that is one thing that we can walk away from knowing is that when our loved ones are gone, we may not be able to physically see them or talk to them like we normally would have on a on a day-to-day -day regular basis, but that is by no means to say that they are gone. They are here, they are around. Uh and it just varies a bit on how much of their presence we can feel. So anyway, I hope this video has helped your understanding or your perception of death, maybe brought some comfort, brought some understanding, brought some peace to your mind about this whole thing. Perhaps you have suffered the loss of loved ones uh, recently and, and, and no matter how much time goes by, um, when they leave this plane and when they go into the mound, you'll always feel that you know, sadness, that loss, but uh, getting to think about it is that, you know, they may not be here in front of my face. I can't see them. I can't talk to them regularly. It's, it's a different perception, but 
never think of them as being completely gone. And I hope that that helps. So if you liked this video and you liked what I had to offer, please comment down below and be sure to like the video, share it around and tell your friends, you know, um, I appreciate everyone's inclusion and response. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, the patrons on Patreon, it's a huge, huge thank you. I am trying to work on uh, building up a membership uh, option here on the channel as well. Um, for those that don't want to do the Patreon thing, I'm, I'm still coming up with some of the added perks uh, or benefits of YouTube membership. So that will all be coming. It's just been a bit busy uh, for me lately. So thank you all again for tuning in, watching today's video. Hail, and we will talk to you in the next video.